So good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to everyone joining us today. I don't know exactly where you are, except I'm delighted you could be with us today for this very special event, a preview of our modern and contemporary art signature auction that takes place June 18th at our world headquarters in Dallas and, of course, online. This is our very first live virtual auction preview, which lets Heritage Auctions into your house since for the moment you cannot come to our new one. For the foreseeable future, we'll be inviting our experts here to preview upcoming auctions, to discuss some notable lots, and to field questions from the audience seated in this virtual gathering space. My name is Robert Wolanski, Heritage Auctions Communications Director. And for the next half hour or so, I will be fielding those questions from you via the Q&A feature below. Please send them to me anonymously and I will ask them of our expert joining us, his, joining us here today. None other than the great Leon ben Ramon, Heritage Auctions Vice President in Modern and Contemporary and quite literally a child of the art world. One of the reasons I came to Heritage a few months ago was to be around momentous and important things, to hold history in my hands as it were, and to be around experts capable of making me learn something without making me fall asleep. Leon is that times a thousand, and I'm incredibly thrilled to kick off these sessions with him. If anything goes wrong today, blame me, not Leon. I uh, used to be very good at technology. As I got older, I found it's not very good to me. But Leon has chosen some very personal favorites from this auction. However, feel free to ask me anything to ask Leon. So with that, Leon, I'm going to uh, ask you to take it away, my friend. Welcome. It's Thank good you. to see you. You have a beautiful uh, background there. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I'm happy to be joining you uh, live from, from Los Angeles, Beverly Hills, uh, not too far away from our office here. And uh, I'm really pleased to be able to share with you some of my favorite uh, highlights in our upcoming sale of modern and contemporary art, uh, which, as you mentioned, takes place uh, June 18th. Uh, at uh, 11 a.m. Central Time, uh, noon Eastern, or uh, 9, a, uh, 9 a.m. for us out here in L.A. Um, and this is really, it's a, it, this is an in incredible auction. Um, it, it's a really interesting auction. There's a lot of diversity in the auction. Um, and we've really been able to kind of pull together what I think are an incredible set of works. And um, you're, you're scrolling there, you can kind of see some of the diversity, a lot of our, our top lots um, are spread, spread out uh, throughout the sale. And um, with that said, you know, I, I think we can only start with, with our top lot in the auction, um, which is by the incredibly important American pop artist, Wayne Thiebaud. Um, Thiebaud is really strongly um, kind of identified with the, the uh, San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, he's also identified very strongly with the American pop art movement uh, and has always kind of been included in the canon alongside Andy Warhol uh, and uh, Roy Lichtenstein. And this painting, Orange Drink from 1961, is incredibly important. Um, it, it, it is very early in Thibaut's career. Uh, and, and for those who kind of understand the trajectory of art history and understand Wayne Thiebaud's importance, this is a pinnacle work. Uh, the reason being that it is so early in his career. It's really where he's already found his signature style. He's already looking at things like condiments or um, various different foods um, that really make uh, his compositions almost jump off the canvas. This really thick impasto that he's using um, both in the background and uh, when depicting each of the objects. You can see there as Robert scrolling through the, the kind of uneaten hamburger and the, the heaping pile of French fries just being ready to, to be eaten. And, and that's really a huge part of, of what Thibaut would become known for later on, um, is this, this almost uh, edible quality of his artworks um, because of the impasto and the, the, the paint that he was using. Um, this is a really nice size canvas at 22 by 36 inches. Uh, as you can see in the top right, it is signed. And it's also just got an incredible provenance. Um, you know, sometimes we're really fortunate where we get to handle museum quality works. Um, this work was shown in 1962 at the Pasadena Art Museum. Um, as you can see the label there on the back. Uh, it was loaned by Alan Stone Gallery, which was Wayne Thiebaud's longtime dealer. 
um, who you know worked with Thibaut basically from the beginning of his career until he passed away in 2006. So you know this is just an incredibly his, uh, important work historically, um, and it hasn't changed hands many times. Uh, it's it basically went from the artist um, to uh, the artist cooperative gallery, which was a, an early gallery that, that Thibaut had worked with. And then it's been in a, a private collection ever since. So this really hasn't seen the light of day in almost 70 years. Um, so that's, it's really Im impressive. And as a result of that, um, the condition is also just spectacular. Um, you know, our, our, our condition report, uh, we, we did our best to try to find um, some thing, uh, but really the, 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 the canvas is in perfect condition and in perfect shape um, and does not have anything um, <laughs> excuse me, sorry about that. Leon, it's um, always good to have a special guest join us. Exactly, yeah, we had a special guest join us. My apologies for that. It's all right. Um, um, and, you know, as I was mentioning, this, this show in 1962 that this work was, was included in really solidified um, Thibaut's place in the pop art movement and put him alongside Andy Warhol and Roy Lichtenstein. Um, and so, you know, the, the auction estimate for this work is 1.2 to 1.8 million. Um, we feel that's very conservative. Uh, um, last season, we sold a, uh, a Wayne Thibault painting, um, very much different, but um, uh, in some ways also very similar. Uh, that was a, a kind of dessert uh, uh, blueberry custard. And so that, that had a, a kind of different resonance. Um, and that work sold for um, nearly three and a half million dollars. Um, the, the bid is currently at 600000 for this work, but we have a really high expectation that it'll continue to go up in value. Um, Leon, we have a question about this particular piece. Sure. I'm glad you mentioned yeah. blueberry custard because it came up as well. Somebody, yeah. in the auction, somebody in the audience asks, Thibaut is best known for his paintings of various kinds of food and drink, orange drink here, blueberry custard, which you just mentioned. Did his popularity grow from that food and drink theme, or was he already widely popular before these particular pieces? No, I'd say that really his, his ability to, to kind of paint these, these uh, food objects is really what he's been known for. And I think especially when he was doing this work in the early 1960s, for many people, it, it didn't resonate yet. Uh, they didn't quite understand the work. And you have to keep in mind that this was just after abstract expressionism had really landed on the scene in America in the 1950s, um, just after World War II. And so you had a lot of people basically saying that painting is dead. Um, you know, that painting, that nothing really new can be done in painting, that there isn't like a new subject matter, a new idea. And so here you have, you know, uh, Thibaut alongside Warhol and Lichtenstein really trying to explain and show how untrue that is. And, and how much painting is very much alive. One of my kind of favorite Thibault quotes is uh, that he says, people say painting, uh, painting's dead. Fine, it's dead to you, I don't care. Painting is alive for me, painting is life for me. And I think that that, that kind of expression really, that, that phrase really just illustrates what kind of time period he was working in. You know, um, a lot of these artists were, you know, clawing their way back into the galleries, into the scene in order to be able to present their works. And so, you know, especially in a place like the West Coast, which would become a major hub for artists and artistic production, um, you know, Wayne Thibault really was the pioneer of, of the, the San Francisco Bay scene um, and really uh, is kind of like the, uh, the patron saint, I'd say, uh, I'd say for, for that particular movement. All right, the longer we look at this piece, the more I realize I have not yet had lunch. So <laughs> it is an extraordinary piece. It's certainly one of my favorites and one of the highlights, but I know there are several other pieces you'd like to discuss. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. Another one as well. Sure. Why don't we move on to the Helen Frankenthaler? Um, this is Leprechaun from 1991. I will point out that it's a uh, lot number 77043. Um, we can always drop the first two digits there. So it's, it's just lot number 43 in our sale. Um, and this is a, another fantastic composition. As you can see here, it, it's, it's just quintessential Frankenthaler. Um, Helen Frankenthaler, of course, um, was a uh, American abstract expressionist. She was very famously um, married to Robert Motherwell. And so they, this entire second tier scene, um, which also included artists like Friedel Zubas, uh, which we'll look at later, 
Um, they were really taking a look at what Jackson Pollock and Mark Rothko before them did and expanding on that. And so Frankenthaler is really incredibly well known for this, you know, her, her practice of staining canvases um, and soaking them with, with the paints. She was using turpentine in order to, to break down the paints and, and make them more solvent. Um, that way she could stain the canvases with them. And so they all have this really incredible, you know, iridescent um, kind of glow um, because the, 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 the paint is not necessarily sitting on the canvas, but it's rather part of the canvas. Um, and this particular work, Leprechaun, is interesting because as opposed to the works that she was making in the 1960s and 70s, um, when she was working in the 1990s, it was a very different world. It was a very different art world. You know, um, she found herself uh, being surrounded by a new wave of abstract expressionists. So she, you know, uh, was part of that second tier movement, uh, watched it kind of dissipate and, and fall out of favor, and then saw it kind of be reborn and, and, uh, and reinvigorated by artists like Gerhard Richter, Anselm Kiefer, um, Julian Schnabel. So, you know, when she's making this work later in her career, she has that ability of being able to look back um, at, at her experience and um, the, the changes in the art world, but still kind of stay true to her form and to be able to, to you know, create a, uh, a composition um, that still very much um, embodies the, the ideas of abstract expressionism, the, the very gestural um, paint you can see, the, the red and the orange that she's using at the top, um, and the, the stain uh, that's being used to create the background. And then, you know, I think, and this might be my, my read into it, but, you know, I think the, the kind of obviously the subdued nature of the greens throughout um, the composition really kind of harp, hearkening back to that idea of luck and to the leprechaun and, um, and to that part of, of, of culture. Um, and, you know, this is, it's, it's a really nice size canvas. Uh, I'd like to say, you know, at, at 34 by 58, it's really large, and, and Frankenthaler was known for working on large-scale canvases. Um, but, you know, this is just kind of like one of those perfect sizes that, that falls in the in-between, um, you know, where it, it is obviously also really uh, easy uh, as opposed to some of her much larger canvases. And similarly to the Wayne Tebow that we just looked at, um, this work has been in the same private collection since 1991, so since the year it was made. Um, which is just incredible. And it, and it goes to show that this work and, and the Tebow, you know, when a collector has something really fantastic, they rarely want to give it up. Um, and so this, again, has not seen the light of day in, in 30 years, basically. So we're really fortunate and we're really excited to be able to offer this work. Um, the auction estimate for this work is $300,000 to $500,000. Um, and so we feel that, uh, you know, in, in terms of looking at where Frankenthaler has been, but more infor importantly, um, where Frankenthaler is going, um, we just, you know, feel like this is a really fantastic and very easy to acquire canvas. Thank you for level. mentioning, by the way, the, 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 the size and scope of the piece, because somebody, sure. somebody did just ask a question, and it is sort of for me, but it also addresses something. They, mm -hmm. they, since these are virtual auction previews, um, and many of us at this point are kind of scattered around the country, uh, I'm in Dallas, Leon's in Los Angeles, and, and certainly is all over the place. He is not actually with the piece at the moment. We do hope in the future to have folks at the uh, with their pieces, but at the moment we don't have that capability, at least not in all of the auctions. Mm. Uh, someone was saying that it would help to judge the size and scale of the piece. So, so certainly mentioning its size is, is important, Leon, and I appreciate you doing that. Sure. And also, um, as I said, this is, uh, we want you to be able to, to know the background, the provenance, and, and sort of the beauty of these pieces. And, and that is the great thing about the Heritage website is, it, yes, I am using the site at the moment. You can do that as well. I hope you do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's uh, good to have Leon here to ask him questions as well about the pieces. So, uh, so, so we'll continue to do that throughout this brief. Yeah, absolutely. And, and just to mention that both the Tebow and the Frankenthaler, if you have any extra time, both have fantastic essays written about them um, where you can really kind of dive deeper and understand, um, you know, the context in which both of these works were being made. Excellent. Well, thank you, yeah. sir. Let's move on yeah. to the next piece.
Yeah, so the next work we're going to look at is a very exciting one, uh, very fun work, very happy work. Uh, it's by Keith Haring. It's from 1983, um, and uh, it, is, it is an untitled work. Uh, it's lot number 77092, uh, so lot nine, number 92 in our sale. And uh, this is just, it's such a quintessential, iconic herring composition. You really have every figure that you would want to have in there, um, you know, from the radiant baby, uh, you know, to the television screens, the, the barking dog, um, you know, even the, uh, the broken heart with the year. Um, this is just, it's, it's such a, um, uh, it just incorporates all of the kind of subjects and ideas that you would want to have. Even the UFOs there are fantastic. And what I really love about this composition and makes it uh, different than a lot of other herrings that we see is that it's on plexiglass, um, which is very interesting. This is basically um, from a, a series that he did uh, with only three works that we know of. Um, where he painted directly onto, onto a red plexiglass. So the, that red color there isn't painted, but the gold and the black are. Um, and this measures out also at a very nice size at 32 by 40. Um, it is from 1983. Um, you know, for those who are very familiar with Keith Haring and his marketplace, um, those kind of uh, mid years, I'd say between 1980. 81 and 1985 or 86 are really kind of his prime years. So 83 being right in the middle. Um, and this has a really fantastic provenance. This was um, commissioned by um, Lucio Amelio, uh, who was a dealer and a friend of Herring's in New York. Um, so those three that I mentioned earlier that were all in this red plexiglass um, were included there. Um, and it went from there to the kind of esteemed New York dealer, uh, very well known um, Martos Gallery, um, who at one point also was on the, uh, the board of the Herring Foundation, if my memory serves me correctly. <clears throat> and, um, and specifically, you know, uh, Jose has, has really had a, a very big hand in, in being instrumental in the Herring market. Um, and then from there, it went to a private collection and, and stayed there for, for quite some time. Um, before moving on to Russick Gallery. So it's really only been in two collections, that of Lucio Emilio for a long time and, um, and then being sold through Marcos Gallery to this private collection. Um, so we're really kind of excited to have this. Again, this, this iconography, even just seeing it now on your screen, Robert, it, um, it just has everything you'd want for a Keith Haring. It's work. a best of. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I mean, that's it, really what it feels like. It, it feels like the, uh, it looks like the cover, it's the same cover of those very special Christmas albums that he did. Um, I mean, it, it is, it features, as you say, all the icon, iconography for which he became legendary. I mean, if, if you're going to get a, if you're going to get a herring, this seems to be a, kind of the place to get in on it, right? Absolutely. And, and that brings me to kind of my next little point that I wanted to bring up is um, that the estimate at, at 500 to 700,000, um, is, is really, uh, it's incredibly conservative. And I, I know I've said that for our last few lots and I'll probably save them for the <laughs> next few, but, you know, given, you know, where, where things are at in the marketplace and, and with what's going on in the world, we, you know, we made a very active effort to, to make things incredibly um, conservative and attractive for bidders out there. And uh, we were able to do that luckily for this work. Um, and, and, you know, I think that even a work on paper at this size is, starting to broach that, that uh, you know, uh, half a million dollar mark. And so uh, being that this is a, you know, an original composition and is acrylic, um, it's, it's just really, it's a fantastic work and, and hopefully something that someone will get to acquire and enjoy. So I have two things. I have a statement yeah. I want to uh, just offer real quick from uh, sure. our executives here at Heritage. We will, in fact, have a feature very soon online that will allow viewers to see the work on a wall with an average person for scale. Although, of course, I don't believe there is such a thing as an average person. It's going to be critical for those uh, for the 2D world. Uh, so, so that will be coming. So for those of you who are fortunate enough to have joined us today, you have a sneak peek on a bit of breaking news for Heritage Auctions. And there's also a question from an anonymous attendee here in the audience, which is, how did critics initially respond to paintings on plexiglass instead of more traditional surfaces like canvas or paper? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I think for me especially, um, that is one of the things I look for in an artist is if they're using a new medium. Um, because, you know, as we kind of talked about earlier with Wayne Thiebaud saying painting is dead, a new medium is obviously a way to kind of reinvigorate 
um, you know, something. And so by using a support of plexiglass, I think it's an incredibly interesting idea. Um, and it, uh, again, it's one of the things I look for in an artist. In terms of the critical reception, I don't necessarily know that there was one for this specific work because it was never really part of a gallery show given that it had been commissioned directly by the first owner. Um, so I don't believe that this was shown anywhere um, specifically where it would have had some kind of critical reception. But I think in more general terms, um, you know, for the most part, you know, uh, I think art critics are always excited by seeing some kind of new medium, um, always being excited uh, by, by seeing some, an artist take uh, an old idea and, and reinvent it by using a different support or a different medium. Um, and one other thing to kind of mention there, Robert, as you were scrolling on the, on the right side there, you can see the herring signature and it is in reverse. So he did sign it on the back, but it, because it's plexiglass, it does come through and you can see that it, it does very affectionately there say for Lucio. Um, you know, so it's just really, uh, in terms of a, a work that, um, is, is doing something new. I think the idea of using plexiglass is, uh. It, that that signature on the back really kind of underscores the fact that it's uh, it is a piece of plexiglass, which is very cool. Well, it's one of my favorite pieces in here. And, uh, yeah, mine too. So let, let's 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 talk about another one sure. I've sort of yeah. become obsessed with in the last uh, few weeks. Uh, this is a, a a remarkable piece, and I, I got to know a great deal about Nevelson's uh, fondness sure. for these kinds of pieces. Mm. But let's let's get to it because when I zoom in, I think that the the discussion and history of what this piece really is will be fascinating. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, you know, this is a, a Luis Nevelson work, as you just mentioned. It's lot number five, so it's very early in the sale. Um, the reason being it comes from the collection of Elaine and Perry Snyderman, um, really fantastic collectors um, that we're really fortunate at Heritage to have the opportunity to sell um, uh, large parts of their collection that have been spread out through many various auctions um, at the auction house. So that's a kind of property um, collection to, to kind of keep an eye out for. They really just had this incredible keen eye, this real great attention to detail, and they really picked out just fantastic quality works. So we're really um, kind of honored and, and um, uh, really grateful to be able to offer this work. Um, this is Moonzag 3, and so Nevelson very frequently worked in series. Um, this is from 1979, uh, and this uh, is very much in, in in line with her very signature style, uh, these wooden uh, reliefs that almost act as wall sculptures um, are, are just very much what Nevelson is known for. And Robert, as you're scrolling through, you can just see the level of detail, um, how she really um, created this composition um, very painstakingly, um, really uh, looking at every single little part of the composition and adding to it, adding different um, shapes and figures, different blocks of wood. Uh, and then of course, at the end, by painting the entire you know, wall sculpture black, um, she, she really um, you know, uses those materials and those forms to, you know, to almost kind of invoke a, a, a domestic environment, right? So it almost looks like it could be a floor plan. It's very architectural, um, you know, and, Many of these, especially in the uh, this, this series, the, the Zags, um, by, by creating these different sized bo uh, boxes and, and filling them with machined objects and spray painting them, you know, she's creating a, a very complex arrangement. And uh, for many of, of her works, uh, we, we very frequently sell Louise Nevelson works here at Heritage. But um, in terms of the level of complexity, I have to say this is probably... Um, one of the most um, advanced works that we've sold. And this too, again, just a really fantastic provenance. Um, this came from Pace Gallery. I believe we have a, a shot of the label on the back. Um, so Pace, you know, being one of the most important galleries um, in American history, I'd say, and Louise Nevelson having worked with Pace, um, you know, for, for decades. So just really fantastic provenance, the fact that it was sold through Pace um, and then, and then has been in this collection uh, since 1980. So only a year after it was made, it was purchased and has been in the same collection ever since. So again, having not seen the light of day for 40 years, it's just always very exciting um, for, uh, for us to be able to sell works that, that haven't changed hands very frequently and, and that really get collectors excited. 
Um, so the opening bid for this, for this work is currently at $40,000. Um, I think if you compare it to other Nevelsons that have sold in the past, um, you know, you, you will uh, be able to see that we, you know, we expect that to, to really go up from there. And um, yeah, it's, it's just a, a really fantastic composition and it's a, it's a real uh, trophy work, I'd say. And, and measuring at 25 and a half by 28 inches, um, again, it's still very manageable. So um, really, really love this composition and really happy that we're able to sell it. Um, and it is, I, I should mention, seven and three quarters, almost eight inches deep. So it does really have that presence that you want to see with the Nevelson work. Um, you really do want to have that three-dimensional quality when it's, when it's on the wall. It is kind of remarkable how Nevelson took these sort of common and everyday pieces like Lincoln logs and, and turned them into fine art. Yeah. I, I got really obsessed when, when looking at the zags and, and, and beginning to sort of understand a bit about Nevelson's process. It was fascinating to think about what, what, what was made out of how, how you can turn the everyday into something incredibly valuable and thought provoking. Absolutely. Yeah. This idea of taking, you know, lowbrow objects and turning them into highbrow art is, you know, it's an idea that many artists have worked with over the years, but you know, I do think that for Nevelson, it does take some of the ideas of pop where Lichtenstein is, is using a comic book strip or Warhol is using the Campbell soup image um, and elevating that. And even though it's, it's radically different in terms of its composition, you can see how that idea is still transpiring and still coming through in a, in a work like this. So a couple of questions that have come up uh, sure. while we're talking about this. When we talk about, this is from uh, somebody attending, when we talk about a piece coming from a collection as we have, is the significance in the size of the collection or the rarity of a certain item in that collection? Uh, does the, is that, does it impact sort of, uh, I'm, I guess I'm, is, sure. coming from yeah. How, what is the impact of that or does the name of the collection impact the value of a lot? Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's no doubt that, you know, coming from an important collection, um, especially like, uh, like the Snyderman collection, you know, I, I think it does a number of things. The first one is, you know, uh, if it's coming from a large collection, especially a collection that's known for quality, like, like the Snyderman collection is, then, you know, that I think is almost like a seal of approval. It's a stamp of approval that you kind of, um, as a collector will know that, um, you know, this was really purchased, you know, by some visionary collectors and some collectors who really had scouted out and had an opportunity to buy multiple different works and chose this one. Um, I think the other important aspect there is, again, that you also have that kind of certainty of knowing that it hasn't traded hands frequently. It's not a work that's gone through the marketplace over and over again, that it was really kind of a loved and cherished item and that, you know, it's, it's, it's being sold now, um, you know, not for any kind of, you know, gain, but really because it needs to be sold. Um, and aside from that, I think, you know, for, especially for some very well-known collectors and for some very well-known celebrities, let's say, um, that, that provenance carries value over time. Um, you know, so for example, you know, the Michael Crichton collection or, you know, even Andy Warhol's personal collection, those collections over time, um, even five years, 10 years, 20 years later, um, you know, we've seen that they carry a significant premium over a very similar or comparable work um, that does not have that additional provenance. So I'd say it is very important. Um, and, uh, you know, again, depending, uh, depending on who the collection was and what the name was, uh, it'll, it will vary in terms of how much it adds, but uh, it'll, it'll certainly be adding something. Excellent. Well, yeah. thanks, Leon. Let's move on to the next piece because yeah. I know we're, uh, I don't want to, I know we're taking up some folks' time, and, and I don't want to. Yeah, we yeah. Have, well, we have some we'll questions get... that are piling up in the queue. Uh, sort of. Okay. Questions sure. Waiting for the end. Great. So um, this, this is a, a, just an amazing composition by Friedel Zubas. It's a called Above Below. It's from 1983, um, acrylic on canvas, and and this is huge. Um, this measures out at 50 by 96 inches. So Zubas is really well known for working in almost exclusively in, in two large sizes, um, 72 by 72 and this 50 by 96. Um, and you know, that, uh, is for a lot of Zubas collectors, really what they want to have. They want to have one of these large size, um, canvases. We've had a lot of interest in this work already. We're expecting to see much more interest. Um, very interesting work. Uh, also, 
was acquired by a private collection um, many, many years ago, many decades ago, actually, and uh, has been in the same private collection ever since. Um, so this comes from our, our backyard. It's been in, in Texas, I think, for the better part of 30 years now. So we're really happy to be able to offer this and to sell this work. Um, very interestingly, uh, and this happens sometimes, the owner of the work wasn't familiar with all of the provenance, but uh, we're very grateful that the Friedel Zubas Estate Archives was able to help us in cataloging this. And so we found out that the work was actually originally exhibited at Bergruen Gallery in, in San Francisco, which is still probably the premier gallery in, in San Francisco, or one of the premier galleries in San Francisco. Um, and then uh, very quickly uh, was sold and then changed hands once again to our, to our consigner. Um, and what makes this work very cool and very interesting for me, and this is so rare, uh, you very rarely hear something like this, um, is that Zubas very specifically for this work indicated that it can be hung one of four ways. <laughs> um, it, he very specifically said the orientation of the painting can be either horizontal or vertical. Um, so I think that that's just so interesting and it's so um, kind of fun. And I think even from a collector perspective, it, it's a completely different canvas and a completely different composition when you, when you turn it around or when you flip it. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a really fun kind of tidbit about this work. Uh, and again, because it's been in a private collection for so long, it's in immaculate condition. It's an online canvas, um, especially for a canvas this large, um, it is sometimes infrequent to find works that really don't have many condition issues, and this is one of them. So um, it's a really great composition, and it's something we're very excited to offer. And at you know, forty to sixty thousand, um, we feel like th that's that's uh, just the kind of tip of the iceberg, just the start. Um, you know, the last uh, of the large Zubas works that we sold, I believe, nearly broke a hundred thousand dollars, and that was, you know, um, very recently. So we have some really high hopes for this work. Leon, if I were to buy it, could I hang it diagonally? Uh, that's a good question. The artist didn't uh, specify that, but, um, you know, I, I, again, I do appreciate the fact that he did give us some kind <laughs> of leeway as to how we, we get to display it. Excellent. Well, let's move yep. on. Yep. Um, so this is a work by Sam Gilliam, um, who is a living artist, um, very important, influential artist, um, associated with the Washington School and really one of the kind of the uh, pioneers and leaders of the Washington School, the color uh, of, of color field, um, you know, the Washington Color School having become an incredibly important movement. Um, but more importantly, Sam Gilliam himself having really kind of earned his due and, and in the last few years has had this complete um, revitalization of his marketplace. People really kind of looking at the work he was making and how he was making it. Um, and what I think makes this, this composition so fantastic um, is the, as, as you're scrolling through, it's this combination of almost collage, because it is a mixed media work, and, and paper pulp. Um, so by using this mixed media and by using these different kinds of papers and then pulping them together, um, it, it almost feels and looks very much like a collage work. Um, and, uh, and it almost and feels it is. very alive. I mean, yeah, it's sort exactly. of like bloodstream here. It's a very yeah. living piece. L exactly. A lot of movement in his work. Um, you know, Sam, um, uh, especially being a living artist, and I'd say even, uh, you know, being an artist of color, being an African-American artist, you know, um, really kind of broke down a lot of the barriers, I think, in, within the art world, um, you know, in terms of, of really be, being one of the first African-American artists, uh, especially in, in, in recent times, to have a lot of market success. Um, and has really kind of paved the way for so many other artists out there. Um, and, uh, you know, at, at uh, 22 by 29 inches, also just a really nice size. And this is the fifth in the series. Um, so, you know, for those who know Gilliam's works, um, you know, the 50s and 60s works are, are, are usually the most sought after. But, you know, these 70s works are just really hit a very nice tone. You can really see that he's come into his own. Um, you can really see that he has a masterful appreciation um, and ability to use color. Um, so he's really, in terms of his ability to use color to, to tell a story and to really become a storyteller, um, as you can see in this composition, it, it, it just bar none. Um, and at 20 to 30,000, the estimate here, the opening bid is at 10,000 um, right now. So, you know, we feel like that's, uh, that's 
just a, a, a fraction of where it has to go. Uh, we expect it to, to go very well from there. Um, and I will mention that from a condition perspective, especially with these works on paper, it's always important to kind of know exactly what's going on with the work. And this work in particular um, has a very uh, small amount of skinning um, to the back and some adhesive residue. Um, but other than that, it's, it's really just in great condition. Uh, and skinning is, is fairly common when it comes to work on paper, especially things that were framed in the 1970s and 80s, where framing practices weren't as advanced as they are now. So, so um, there, is, there is a question about the title. Mm -hmm. it's, it's MIBS number five? Yes, indeed. Do we know what MIBS, what MIBS is? That's MIBS a was, a, was a, is a, uh, a kind of smaller series that he did. You know, Gilliam was very um, uh, kind of thorough in terms of um, labeling all of his series, uh, giving them all different um, titles, and then numbering all the works within the series. Um, so, you know, you'll very frequently see, um, you know, most Gilliam works have a very specific uh, sale, uh, excuse me, a series title name. Um, so MIBS was, was just the name of the okay. series that he did in the 70s. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, that's pretty much. You had mentioned also, somebody else asked, you had mentioned a moment ago skinning. Could you define that for beginning collectors? Sure, absolutely. So, um, well, this work has, has two separate things and they usually go side by side. Um, so when, when framers uh, would frame works on paper, especially in the 70s and 80s, as I mentioned, they'd use adhesive to, in order to put the artwork onto a board. Um, and so unfortunately, they use what's called non-archival adhesive. Now every framer out there uses an archival adhesive, which would allow you to remove the work from that board without causing any damage to it. Um, but because of the way this was framed at that time, there is a little bit of adhesive which remains on the artwork. And by the same token, when it was removed from the board, a little bit of the paper from the back of the artwork remained on the board. So it's not a major condition issue, and it's certainly something that we see very frequently with works on paper, um, but it is something to note, and it is something that's kind of important um, to mention. But again, you know, for a work like this, um, you know, if a condition issue, a major condition issue, or a, a really a, a, a condition issue wor worth kind of uh, grappling with would be um, somewhere in the image on the front of the of the work. Um, you know, both those those things, the adhesive and the, the skinning being on the on the verso on the back of the work, you know, make them um, not not so important in my in my opinion, of course. So let's go from a living artist, yeah, to the most famous artist around. Someone we're sure. all well familiar with. Yeah, absolutely. So um, this is a uh, just a really great composition by Pablo Picasso. It's a work um, that we've been uh, kind of eyeballing for a long time, and I believe we had it in house for quite some time. And um, and uh, you know this um, this is just you know you, you can't really have a modern contemporary art auction without looking at Picasso. Um, so from 19, circa 1951, this is lot number nine in our sale. Um, so this is brush and ink on paper. It is that kind of very almost a typical paper size uh, that Picasso used so frequently at 10, almost 10 and a half inches by uh, almost eight and a half inches. Um, and this very similarly came from a very important estate. So back to that question that was asked earlier, um, you know, how important is, is the estate um, this came from the estate of John and Elaine Steinbeck. Uh, so we're really happy to be able to offer that. Um, and you can see there kind of some of the provenance labels um, of where it had kind of previously been around. And you can see it you know, dated over there saying Elaine, Elaine Steinbeck in, in 1998. Um, so, you know, that, that uh, kind of adding a little bit to the provenance there. But in terms of a, a Picasso composition, it, it's just very quintessential. You know, the mare and all fall, mother and child, was something that, that Picasso visited so many different times in his career. Um, you know, uh, walking through the halls of the MoMA as a child, I, you know, so many of, the, of that imagery of a mother and child was, uh, by Picasso specifically, was just so incredibly important to him. It was an idea that he harkened back to so frequently. And um, this really just has that really kind of simple, beautiful art, artistic expression um, that you would look for. Um, and, uh, you know, you can see there the kind of mother really embracing the child and, um, and the, both of her hands there. And, you know, in, in a fashion that really only Picasso and Matisse were able to do, 
um, you know, he's almost using just a singular line, a singular, um, you know, uh, 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 ink line to create that almost entire composition. And the, the simplicity of it, I think, is, is something that, uh, you know, Picasso really excelled at. But more importantly, um, I would say that in, in terms of the, uh, the overall composition, it's also just a really nice size and it's a really um, approachable work. Uh, for any collector out there who wants to acquire an original Picasso. So it's interesting, you, you did note that the fact that uh, there were several Picasso pieces over about 50 years actually that were sort of named Mary Enfant. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and someone asked the question, and I want to follow up with a question of my own. Since there are several pieces, uh, including many that were done during this period, some of which look similar to but are not this piece, because I believe that these were pieces that were painted um, while he was living in the, on the coast. He was beginning a new mm -hmm. family. Exactly. Uh, in the earlier Mer Elm font pieces, those particular <laughs> pieces, if I recall correctly, where mother and child were very distant. These pieces bring mother and child very close together, sort of making a very exactly. good point that this is the point in his life in which Picasso had become very happy with two new children um, uh, with whom he do uh, who he doted on. Oh, absolutely. You know, and I, you, that was a very well said. Um, you know, thank you for that, Robert. But you know, that idea of of the embrace is just so incredibly important. And uh, as opposed to works where that he was making in the nineteen twenties and thirties, where he was depicting um, mother and children very much apart. Um, you know, having not necessarily had children of his own uh, just yet. You know, as, as you just uh, alluded to. You know, as he started having children of his own, um, you know, this this idea became more and more dear to his heart, and something that he again continued to explore on a very regular basis. Because those earlier pieces were observing, observant pieces. Mm -hmm. These are more yeah. autobiographical personal. pieces. Yeah, these are more personal. Absolutely. So someone asked that regard because I asked my question first. Mm -hmm. That's just the kind of guy I am. Um, someone says, since there are several pieces of this period that resemble this, that are sort of of a series. If a collector were lucky enough to acquire more than one of them, would having the set or part of the set make them more valuable than simply mm. having the sum of their prices as individual lots? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'd say that uh, in regards to this specific work, uh, not necessarily because mother and child is just, it's an idea that he revisited on a very regular basis but it's not necessarily a series. Um, it would be very different if it was a specific series that was done in a specific time period. Um, but you know, this work being from 1951, many other depictions, you know, uh, having done probably every year of his career, I'd say, uh, I, if, if I had to guess, you know, there, there isn't necessarily, it's not necessarily part of a single body of work, um, but I would imagine if it was all part of a single body of work, then yes, there'd be a whole lot more value added. Um, I would, however, kind of put an asterisk there and say that if a specific collector had, you know, many of these, then obviously the presentation of an idea is always very powerful and it's always very strong. And, and we, of course, use that here at Heritage on a regular basis for a lot of our sale categories, especially when we present single owner collections where you know, there is a lot of consistency of a singular theme or a singular idea in the auction. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say that there's, there's definitely some value to be acquired there, but not as much as if you were to acquire an entire series. And I assume the fact that this belonged to John Steinbeck and his wife is a significant part of its provenance and perhaps of its price. Absolutely. That's, that's why it was one of the first things I mentioned and that yeah. I brought up. It just, you know, again, with, with the strong provenance, that can sometimes go such a long way. Um, and, and it can't be underscored enough, especially when it's someone as known as, as you know, John Steinbeck was. So, yeah. Well, before I let you go, and by the way, thanks for this. I, I, of course. I, I've learned a lot. It's fascinating. I hope everyone here has learned a great deal. And if you have any further questions, we'll get to that in just a moment. But there, are, there were a couple of general ones, and I'll take this sure. to the general page here in a moment. Someone said, I see a growth in street and urban art and heritage that is quite interesting. How is the transition from guys like Herring, who was chalking New York subways, to urban artists of today? And who are a couple of younger artists that are on the top of your radar? 
Well, that's a great question. And uh, frankly, not one I expected to field for this auction. Um, <laughs> I do uh, also work on our, on our urban art and our street art sales. And Herring, for what it's worth, along with Basquiat, is the patron saint of the urban art world. And, you know, um, to a lot of people's different uh, kind of uh, uh, surprise, you know, Herring can be sold both in urban art sales and in modern and contemporary sales. Uh, modern and contemporary category has a tendency to pluck out artists from the urban art sales once they get to a certain value level. Um, but, you know, Herring really informed everything that has happened in the last 40 years when it comes to street art and urban art. Um, he's, he's really influenced a huge set of artists now. Um, you know, the idea of, of making work in public, making work that's ephemeral, um, you know, through his subway drawings, making works in subway stations, um, you know, before the advent, you know, of modern day graffiti, all of these things just incredibly important and relevant to Herring. Um, but yeah, to, to kind of follow up on that, on the second part of that question, you know, some artists that we've been looking at that we sell very frequently at Heritage, I'd say Paul Insect is really an artist that we've, we've been looking at very closely. Um, Pose is another one of the artists that we've been looking at very closely. Uh, Invader, we just had a street art auction last week where Invader prices doubled, if not tripled. Um, uh, we also have uh, quite, quite a, a large number of artists that are all kind of percolating at the same time. Um, so, so, you know, the, those artists, you'll, you'll have to check into our urban art sale for the, to get a little bit more on those, but those are just a couple names. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to being able to do this very same forum for our urban art sale, um, which we do have on June 24th, um, so later this month. But uh, back to our modern and contemporary sale, I, I encourage and hope everyone will get an opportunity to bid. Um, on June 18th, once again, it's at uh, 11 a.m. Central Time, uh, noon um, Eastern, and uh, 9 a.m. LA Time. Uh, and it, again, it's, it's just really a, a real a fantastic uh, curated group of works that we're able to offer, 146 lots in the sale. Um, so I'd really you know, tend to say that there's something for everyone, both stylistically and also in terms of um, budgetary. Well, I have to say it's a, it's a remarkable piece in, in, and I've scrolled through this entire auction. There's many pieces I'd like to ask you about, but I know it's a Friday and I'm sure people have some stuff to do, including you, Leon. Sure. <clears throat> Next time we do this, by the way, we're going to make you walk through your house and show us everything behind <laughs> you because uh, I'm, I, I, I want to know appreciate that. all of those. Um, if people have questions for you, how can they best reach you uh, before this or any other auction? Absolutely. I'm always available to help both, um, you know, people looking to acquire works, add works to their collection, whether it be through this auction or in any of our other modern and contemporary art auctions, including prints and multiples and street art. I'm also always able, able to help um, anyone who needs help selling uh, works. Always happy to be of service. The best way to get in touch with me is to email me. My email is it's pretty easy. It's my first name and my last name initial. So it's Leon, L-E-O-N. And then the letter B, like boy, at ha.com. Um, and that's always the best way to, way to, way to reach me. And I uh, usually try to be incredibly responsive there on email. Well, I certainly do appreciate you uh, doing this. And uh, again, my pleasure. Thank you. In the future, for those of you who have asked, if several people have pointed out that they would like for us to do these while you are with the pieces, and, and we do hope to do that one day. This is, as I said at the, the beginning, our very first one of them. And they're done because we're all certainly living in interesting times and having to make interesting consolations to the way we show things. But we want to make sure that you have the opportunity to ask questions of those who know the most about these pieces. That's why we asked Leon to be here today. We'll keep doing these with other folks in other categories. So that's, that's what the point of this is. And again, as we begin rolling these out, we will expand them. And we do hope that many of our experts will be next to able to touch, able to show, and have a very visceral uh, experience as well. So uh, this is just the beginning. Thanks for joining us. If you have Thank questions you. for me, it's robertw at ha.com. If you have uh, ideas on how we can improve this, and I have no doubt there are many people watching who do. So I look forward to hearing from you on those. Leon, I'll talk to you soon. Thanks again, my friend. Thank you, Robert. Thanks again. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Robert.